This is episode 97 of the Beyond the Food Show, and today we're talking to Dr. Jillian Murphy, and we're asking the question, can we be fat and healthy? My name is Stephanie Dodier. I'm a clinical nutritionist, and at 35, I was trapped with severe anxiety, panic attack, obesity, and my health completely collapsed. I needed solution, and the journey began. Each episode of the Beyond the Food Show, we bring you an expert or a message to help you achieve your health goal, unlock your self-confidence, and live a better life. This episode of the Beyond the Food Show is brought to you by the Going the Beyond the Food Project, an online conference that is focused on teaching you to ditch the diet mindset, transform your relationship to food, and feel good for good. This is my baby. I handpicked 21 health experts that think and live outside the diet and weight loss dogma box, and they will help you transform your life with a radical new way of looking at health and weight loss, and that will help you heal distorted relationship to food. You can register for free at the goingbeyondthefoodproject.com or use the link in the show notes. If you're listening to this podcast outside the free viewing period, which is November 1st to the 8th, 2017, know that you can still access the recording of the conference on our website, goingbeyondthefoodproject.com with the upgraded package. Now, the question of today is, can we be fat, and I'm using air quote here, and healthy? If weight is such a determining factor of our health, then why thin people get sick? Why some athletes get heart attack? Now, there is a new study that was published recently, and I'll link to the study in the show note, that stated and told us that weight was a strong factor in developing cancer, that the risk of getting cancer were higher if we were overweight. Now, is it true? And I asked myself that question, and I know a lot of you can relate to that because we've had studies that told us, and I'm using air quote here, the studies that told us that cholesterol was related to heart attack. We had studies that told us when we eat too many eggs, we would get a higher cholesterol, which would then give us a heart attack. And we now know today that this is not true. So for the last 20 years, we've been trying to demonstrate that to study, and we finally came out, and people now starting to know this. If you don't know yet, I'll link also in the show note to articles and documents that demonstrate that eating fat, cholesterol have nothing to do with heart attacks. So is it possible that weight have nothing to do with health? Is it possible that weight have nothing to do with cancer? And this is the question that we need to ask ourselves. If you listen to the last podcast, Podcast 96, the statement I was doing rather was the number one reason why nothing changes for you is because we don't take personal responsibility because we listen to dogma, to information, and we accept it for face value because we don't want to take responsibility for ourselves and looking internally for our answer. Well, that is a perfect example of this. We read this title, this headline on media, and we take it for true. And we go on taking decision into our life, believing that we need to lose weight because it's bad for our health. So I invited a friend of mine, Dr. Jillian Murphy, to discuss this information. Dr. Jillian Murphy is a naturopathic doctor that focuses on helping women transform their relationship with food. She has a practice in Kingston, Ontario, Canada. I have also linked to her website in the show notes. So are you ready to do this with me? If so, let's do this. Hey, Julianne, how are you? Hi, I'm great. Thanks. I am so excited to have this discussion with you for everybody's perspective. Me and her have been talking now for 25 minutes before we even (laughs) press... (laughs) The record button, planning some big things for you. But today, the whole topic is, can we be fat and healthy? And yes, I'm using the F word. 
for a very good reason, because I want to trigger a very strong conversation today about a study that I recently saw about cancer risk. So without reading the whole study, the headline is the following, higher your rate of obesity, the higher the risk of cancer. And that was published by many of the people that I follow online in the medical world as a confirmation that being fat is not healthy. And that's the launching point of our conversation with Dr. Jillian about is it possible that being fat has nothing to do with our health? What do you think, Jillian? Well, it's so juicy. So there's like uh, so many things to talk about. I'm like, I don't even know where to start. Okay. So first of all, what I'll say is, is it possible that fat has nothing to do with your health? Like, no, I don't think so. Cause fat is a tissue in our body. Right. And so just like muscle and lymph and, you know, connective tissue, fascia, like all of these tissues are part of make up our physical body. And so of course, fat is part of our health. It's part of our, the way that we move, you know, fat does so many positive things. It helps with the way that we produce hormones and how we insulate our bodies and protect our organs. And it clearly plays a role in our health. So I think the question I typically sort of push women to ask or to think about is, is fat the determinant of health, right? Because in our culture, it becomes this really oversimplified, super reductive, like fat is the devil fat causes everything, fat causes cancer, fat causes diabetes, fat causes hypertension, fat causes atherosclerosis, you know, fat causes all of these things. And when you dig into the research, not only do you see that the numbers don't support it, but these diseases are multifactorial. Like there are so many factors that come into play when it comes to health. And when we have the weight glasses on, we lose all of that. We start to forget or downplay or minimize the many factors, like the many things that play a part in our health and disease process and long-term prognosis from these illnesses. So it's just so much more complicated than just fat is bad, right? It's just so much bigger than that. And I think where you started is a great point for everyone to understand. Fat is a tissue. It's a tissue. That's it. <laughs> you know, like I, so many women I work with, you know, it's like fat is standing in the way of my dreams, you know, yeah. fat. And, you know, I'm not saying this in a patronizing way. I've been there. You know, I've said these things myself. I'm laughing with women, not at. But I often say like, like, are muscles standing in the way of your dreams? Like, is your lymphatic fluid standing in the way of your dreams? Like, it's just simply a tissue. It's the stories that our culture has created around fat that make us believe that fat is standing in the way of our dreams, right? And there is evidence to the contrary all around us if we want to open our eyes and see it. But we have to know that that's even an option to begin with, right? <laughs> and I want for everybody listening right now so to know fat is a tissue and understand that when you are like me reading a story in a newspaper that says obesity is linked to cancer rate, and we automatically go to the place that our fat tissue and our weight number on the scale is increasing the risk of mm -hmm. cancer, it's actually not true. Mm -hmm. Am I correct, Dr. Jillian? Well, okay. So what I'll say is, I, I mean, full disclosure, I haven't read the study that you yeah. just cited. So I can't speak to that specifically. But what I can speak to is... I don't know if you said it when you introduced the study in the podcast or when mm -hmm. we were talking before, but one of the big words that you said was correlation. Yes. They correlated cancer with obesity. And so this is incredibly important because we see this with the sort of like four big sort of disease processes that are associated with fat, you know, cancer, atherosclerosis, hypertension, or high blood pressure yeah. and diabetes type two, the big one that the medical system holds, you know, dear. And what we see in a lot of the studies is that they tend to be correlative, not causative. They're not causal. And so the big difference here is, you know, there's a difference between two things showing up at the same time in the human body. Okay. That is very different from one of those things causing the other thing. And when we confuse that, we start to make some really faulty assumptions. And so, for example, with diabetes, 
you know, it is highly related to weight. So sort of 80% of type two diabetes people are sort of overweight, obese. And so we've taken that, that fact and we've decided that fat causes diabetes. And yet the fact of the matter is genetics is playing a really big role here. And genetics, you know, there's theories that the genes that cause type two diabetes are also genes that may cause people to store fat excessively. There's lifestyle factors, right? There are lifestyle factors that could cause someone to be fat and also cause them to have diabetes. But it doesn't mean that the fat caused the diabetes. Does that make sense? Totally. The fat tissue is not causing the diabetes. It is correlated. And that's the trigger point for everyone listening right now. Causal effect and correlation, two different beasts. Right. It's like blaming firefighters for the fire because every time there's a fire, there they are. Bingo. It's like, oh, you're at the same location. (laughs) So, you know, obviously you cause the fire because every time there's a fire, there's a truck full of firefighters, you know? That's it. Then that's a very important point for non-scientific or non-medical people listening, which is the majority of my audience to understand causal and correlation are two different beasts. So yes, the vast majority of people who have diabetes, probably 80% of them are overweight, but the fat tissue is not causing the diabetes. Right. And you can see that too, when they've done studies on basically like weight reduction. And so for sure, early on, you'll see glucose control a little bit better when there's weight loss. But, Mm -hmm. you know, over time, over sort of 16 to 18 months, studies have shown that the glucose control goes back, like the glucose levels in the blood go back to original values, even when weight loss is maintained. So weight is clearly not dictating glucose control. There's also been some really interesting surgical studies that have been done where, you know, bariatric surgery, right, where the stomach is altered or, you know, there's an operation done to reduce the size of the stomach and glucose control, blood sugar levels are like immediately better in some of these patients before any weight loss has even started, which could indicate that gut hormones may be playing a part. Conversely, liposuction studies where tons of weight, you know, fat is removed from the body, those people don't show a change when fat is removed. So it's like, we have to start thinking about all of the different factors that are coming into play. And the fact that just because fat is there doesn't mean that fat is causing the problem. Awesome. Then the next level of question is, now that we understand that, we also need to understand that what's marketed to us is what's convenient also. So the big headlines on those studies and the article that are being pushed to us are pushing this whole concept of weight because we have an entire industry behind that. And it's much easier for the marketing industry to push the concept of weight and obesity as a way of making you react because that's what we have been sold for dozens and dozens of years that being overweight is a bad thing. It's a stigma and it Mm -hmm. will cause you to get sick. Yeah. I mean, there are so many political and economic factors at play in these messages and it's difficult to sort of address them all in a really simple way or Mm -hmm. really, you know, I mean, there's entire courses now on fat studies, right? In universities and there's readers and some of the stuff that I'm citing is from you know, the really fantastic book, Health at Every Size by Linda Bacon. Marilyn Wan wrote a book called Fat So, but it's like fat so, question mark, exclamation point, Mm -hmm. talking about some of this stuff. Like there's just, it's so huge, right? The cultural conditioning, the economics in terms of like, who's benefiting from the message, right? Like if we believe that fat is bad, pharmaceutical industry starts to benefit because there are drugs out there a little bit less right now, but historically there have been some pretty terrible drugs for weight loss. You know, it's difficult to make money off of listen to your own body (laughs) Mm -hmm. and maybe you're okay. And there's a lot more power and a lot more money and a lot more political sway in a really big, like we have this huge problem and we have to fix it. It also detracts from some of the economic benefit that the government has by subsidizing really bad food for us, right? Like it takes all the attention away from the fact that the food we're being fed 
is not ideal or great, right? And it puts it on fat when instead it's like, that's where the attention should be. It should be on food subsidies and what's going on with money in that realm. And instead it just distracts us. And it presents this war on weight, this war on fat that keeps us from looking at what's actually going on with our health and what the government is actually feeding us. Which is exactly what we should be looking at, but we are being detracted by this whole marketing. So that's very brilliantly said. Now you talked about a concept here, which is health at every size. Yeah. yeah. So this is a movement that is explaining the concept that we can be healthy and still be overweight. Yeah. I mean, it's like, To me, it's even bigger than that. You know, it's like health at every size is a social movement. And the purpose of that movement is to encourage body acceptance and self-confidence in our bodies. And it just, it acknowledges that our overall well-being, which includes mental, emotional well-being and cultivating healthy habits in individuals is just more important than any number on the scale. And it's a beautiful movement. It's a peace movement, right? That is basically suggesting that it is time to stop being at war with our bodies and believing that our bodies need to continually be changed, right? And it operates on a few big sort of values, which is respect. And that respect is not just respect for fat bodies, it's respect for all bodies, it's respect for ethnicity, gender, race, ability, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status. It's respect for the lived human experience and the fact that it's not just weight that affects us, but it's the layering of all of these different identities that starts to really, really affect our health overall. And that, again, that whole idea that when you have the weight glasses on and you forget about all of the different determinants of health that are playing out in the real life human lived experience, you lose so much. You stop treating a human being and you're just treating basically a overly simplified, ridiculously reductive problem. And you treat it by calorie in, calorie out, and exercise. Yeah, <laughs> which, you know, thermodynamics, the bigger problem, weight is so complex in terms of like determinants of health. It's also complex on an individual level, right? Like thermodynamics are not simple. It's not, I was in line at the grocery store this week and it was, you know, that classic woman's world weekly yes. or whatever it's called. And it's drink this, lose three pounds a week. And body diversity is a biological fact in that when they've done studies on large groups of people, and these are not small studies, like these are not fringe studies, you know, there's been big studies done on groups of people and you can feed these people the same things and exercise them in the same ways. And there will be a group of people that might lose weight, but there's a group of people that are going to stay the same size. And there's a group of people that are probably even going to gain weight. And so this idea that we can know exactly the way that a human being burns fuel and stores fuel is just fictitious. It's fabricated. And we can see it in our daily lives, right? Like you can see it in the world around you. If it was that simple, like everyone would be thin. People aren't dumb. People can follow the plans and the messaging and they can work really hard at it. You know, there's this one of the stigmatizing beliefs about fat people is that they're like lazy and they don't work hard and they're kind of stupid. And, you know, I'm being a little bit sensational here, but this is the reality, right? Like I get women to write this stuff out when I work with them. And these are the words that come up over and over and over again. But I've never met people who work harder at anything in their entire lives. Mm -hmm. I've never met people who sacrifice more or invest more time and money and effort and energy than a woman who is trying to lose weight. And typically I'm working with incredibly brilliant, smart, successful women. And their big question is, why can't I get this right? Why can't I figure this out? I get everything else right. I'm a good mom. I run a business. I'm good at work. I'm good with people. And it's like, have you ever stopped to consider that maybe 
the information on which you are operating is incorrect. You know, (laughs) you've been made a promise that can never be fulfilled. And the harder you work at it, the worse things actually get. Totally. And that's the whole base principle and the whole purpose of me creating the Going to Beyond the Food project is for you to explore 21 different reasons why you may have a challenge maintaining your weight if you're not thinking about calories and exercise because there's so much more to this. But this information is not publicized. It's not talked about because it doesn't fit the mold of what the industry is pushing. Yeah. I mean, one of the other big values of health at every size is critical awareness, right? Challenging scientific and cultural assumptions about weight and health. Because again, when we really dig into the literature, the research just doesn't support the messaging that we've been getting. It's been altered. It's been exaggerated. It's been modified to make it seem like it supports our cultural assumptions, but it really doesn't, you know? And For people listening, and I want to correlate this because we have a portion of our listenership that comes from the world of low carb and ketogenic. Mm -hmm. And those people will clearly be aware of the whole paradigm of cholesterol and fat, right? So because when they come to the low carb ketogenic world, they're being told you need to increase your fat, lower your carbs. And the first thing that comes to mind is I'm going to get a heart attack and cholesterol. And through their journey, they're learning that it's just not true that the studies have been twisted to sell drugs and all of this. So if you're yeah. aware of this concept, yeah, I want you to think of what Dr. Jillian is talking about in the same manner. Yeah, that's a great analogy, actually, because for so long, we were fed this like cholesterol kills kind of messaging. And we're seeing quite clearly that that's not true. And I've actually used that firefighter analogy with patients for like 11 years when it comes to cholesterol, right? They're blaming the cholesterol because the cholesterol shows up when there is a heart problem. And yet the studies don't support that it's actually the cholesterol's fault necessarily. I'm being a little bit unclear here that the way that we produce cholesterol is the problem, right? And it's actually like you need to take a step back and figure out why your body is producing cholesterol the way that it is producing it. That's the problem, not the cholesterol production, right? The cholesterol production is there to try and remedy something. Our body is brilliant. Our body is smart. And the cholesterol is laying itself down in our arteries to try and repair and to try and help us and to try and save us. And so we're demonizing the cholesterol when really it's just there to help right? So yeah, it's the same thing, right? Like we've been given these messages about fat and what fat causes and what it does. And we just take it as fact, right? We read about these things in the media and we just assume that it's all true without ever taking a step back to question it. So yeah, so exactly. So I want you to start questioning the concept of obesity versus health risk or whatever other hip risk in the same way that we're viewing the fact that eating butter doesn't lead you to have cholesterol and a heart attack. Mm -hmm. That's exactly the same thing we're talking about today. So what else can trigger weight gain? Because you talked about there is study that talked about weight gain and there is different trigger to weight gain and one of them being set point. Am I correct? Well, not that set point causes weight gain, but it is, I mean, what set point weight is, is basically the range in which, you know, most people will kind of inherently know this, right? It's like when you relax and you just listen to your body, although I shouldn't say most people will know this because so many people have been using external information to manipulate their diet that they don't even remember what this is like. But if you can imagine your set point weight is the weight that you fall back to over and over and over again, when you are not dieting, when you are eating generally nutritious foods, lots of flexibility there, foods that are pleasurable and that you enjoy eating and generally make you feel energetic and well, and you're moving your body in a pleasurable way that you enjoy three or four times a week. And you're really not trying to manipulate anything. Your body will essentially fall to a weight that it likes. And it is understood that that weight is generally healthy, but the issue is it is not predictable. And so what we have learned from height and weight charts and BMI is that we should be able to calculate where that weight will be, right? Mm -hmm. And this is what 
starts to trip people up is that they believe that they know what their set point weight should be. You know, I'm five, four. So my set point weight should be X, Y, Z, right. And when they start to just eat in a balanced, moderate, healthy way and move their body in a way that they really enjoy, if their weight doesn't fall to that level, then they think that they're not there yet, right? That they have to push harder or work harder. And so the key with set point weight is understanding that we don't know what an individual set point weight might be, that there are things that affect our set point. You know, one of the biggest things that affects set point is actually dieting, right? Mm -hmm. Restricting our food. When we restrict our food, our body gets better and better and better at putting weight on because it's protective, right? It's like, our body's one job is to keep us alive. And our body doesn't know the difference between restricting food because you're on a diet trying to get your weight down or an actual famine. And so when you go into a place of famine or food uncertainty, your body gets better and better and better at storing food. And we can see this in the research, right? We can see what happens physiologically. Sandra Amott does a great TED talk on why dieting doesn't usually work. And it's a phenomenal introduction to some of the physiological things that start to happen when we are in food restriction. And so we actually have never seen research that has shown us a diet that produces long-term weight loss. But what we do know about dieting or weight cycling is that we'll often see set point getting bumped up. And it's more complex than that. Mm -hmm. I don't want it to sound so simplistic because there are plenty of women that have dieted their whole lives whose set point is the same. But one of the things that does start to break that internal thermostat, right, that wants to so beautifully regulate our weight at a healthy point is us constantly frigging around with the thermostat, us deciding that, no, 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 we shouldn't be at 21 degrees, we should be at 19 degrees, you know, and so I'm going to continually try to manipulate myself to be at 19 degrees. And then in the effort to, if I'm going to continue with this analogy to like warm things up, all of a sudden your body's at 22 or 23 degrees, right? Because it's trying to fight off that false reduction. Totally. So set point, I just want to say for the listener, I'm going to do a full episode on that in the upcoming mm -hmm. episode, because that is like that hours of discussion about what triggers set point, because there is science, there is literature behind set point. So the goal of today was not to address set point, but rather to introduce you to the concept of set point. Yeah, yeah. And again, I never want to make it seem like it's so simple. But yeah. the basic thing here is just understanding that it's unpredictable. And that also there's typically a range of set point. So meaning people will go up and down within their set point range quite easily. So it's Christmas holidays. So you go up by five pounds or 10 pounds, and then you go back to normal and you return to your set point, And then you're training for a half marathon and it goes down a little bit. And then you go back up. But that range is also inherently unpredictable. So for some women, their set point might be really tightly regulated. And for others, it might be a little bit more loosey goosey. So they seem to be able to go up 15 or 20 pounds and go down 15 or 20 pounds with relative ease. Does that make sense? Totally. And so understanding that your weight number is not a direct correlation of calories in, calorie out and exercise, but also among other things, your particular individual set point. Yeah, that that's like often it's just genetics, right? It's like some people are genetically better at keeping weight on than others. And if you think about it from a sort of evolutionary perspective, that is a really good thing. You know, humans are only like, you know, we're 200,000 years old. We're still relatively young in the grand scheme of things. But of that 200,000 years, there's only been a very small point in time where we have been in food abundance, right? The majority of our evolution has taken place in food scarcity and it being difficult to secure a nonstop food source. And so our bodies have evolved to keep us alive. And it's important to remember that, right? That we are in a new era. We are in a, a really, the first time in history where we have, and I understand that there are parts of the world where there's starvation. And so I'm not discounting that, but we do have grocery stores and freezers and refrigerators. And for the most part, we have access to food all the time, right? And so our bodies are adjusting to this. Our body are trying to evolve through this. Then that creates that set point, which can contribute to our weight. 
And what I want you to understand is that back to our concept to why weight is not linked to health, that's just one of those layers. Back to the cholesterol analogy, right? It's we don't want to kill the firefighter because cholesterol is just the firefighter. The same thing with your weight. Your weight is just something that can be physical symptom of something else that's going on in your body that can then risk for you to have more cancer rate, one of them being, again, just one of them, inflammation. Yeah, sure. And I would say that, like, again, this whole idea of when we have the weight glasses on, Mm -hmm. that we, number one, we start to forget about all of the other things that are at play when it comes to health. And not only that, but when we focus on weight in a really narrow-minded, kind of singularly focused way, there's a significant amount of collateral damage that happens in terms of our relationship with food and our body, right? There's this enormous amount of food and body preoccupation. There's food and health anxiety that starts to show up, eating disorders, there's self-hatred. When our culture approaches health in this way, there's discrimination, right? And so it actually stops us. It becomes a roadblock to actually getting healthier, right? It actually becomes part of the problem. The focus on weight as the thing that is wrong with us actually starts to feed the problem. And it encourages, you know, because this is always the question. It's like, why do we even care? Like, why can't we just pursue weight loss if we want to? And it's like, well, you need to understand that there are so many negative behaviors that are born out of trying to manipulate our weight in a way that our body doesn't want it to go, right? And so you know, an example of this might be, I have a woman that a woman that was a patient of mine who wanted to feel stronger. And so she joined a boot camp, right? And it was super exciting. Like, I'm going to join this boot camp. I've never been an exerciser, but it's a women's only boot camp and it seems really fun and I'm going to try it. And so she did it for sort of like eight weeks and we're chatting throughout the whole process. And, you know, at the end of the eight weeks, she's feeling amazing. She's made great friends. She feels strong she feels healthy. She feels good. And I'm like, amazing. So I guess like you're going to sign up for the next one or whatever. And she's like, well, no, it just, you know, it didn't really do what it was supposed to do. And I was like, what? <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> like you said, you wanted to feel better. You wanted to feel stronger. You feel that. And she's like, yeah, but I didn't, I didn't lose any weight. And so again, when weight becomes the focus, we forget that there are actually like a million healthy benefits to exercise that have nothing to do with weight. And we start to get into this all or nothing mentality where we very quickly dismiss things that are actually really good for us because they're not giving us the weight results that we want, right? And understanding that we actually can become resistant to doing things that are good for us when we're in this frame of mind. And so it's not just about identifying that weight is not necessarily causing the problem, but that when we focus on weight, we can actually detract from our health. Like there's actually collateral damage that starts to happen, right? Yes, and that is why many of you listeners are here today is because you, just like me, have dieted for years and quote unquote, didn't get the result that you wanted, fall off the wagon, gain, loss, gain, loss, gain, loss, because we have those collateral damage currently in our life and we have a form of distorted relationship to food, or we're simply tired of being in this diet mentality that has run our life for the last 15, 20, 10 years, whatever your case is. Yeah. And I would also note that just because you mentioned the going up and going down, like the weight cycling, right? Like when we look at health and what actually affects our health, socioeconomic status is a really big thing, but weight, like the actual cycling of going up and down, we're, we're seeing more and more research coming out that actually suggests that stigma around weight and weight cycling could potentially actually be the thing that is a major player in a lot of these diseases like hypertension, right? So that I think is also interesting to note, right? That one of the solutions that our culture gives us is going on a diet and losing some weight. And then we see ourselves go back up and then we do it again. And the cycle repeats itself. And that may actually be one of the things causing health issues. I would totally agree with that because think about it from a wholesome perspective, losing and gaining weight is a stress to the body. Absolutely. 
Add on that the method into which we're losing the weight, which is in most cases extremely stressful to the body because it's in deprivation, both physical and emotional world. We are then compounding the body into stress and then we go into binge mode yep. after the dieting and overeating is an extreme stress to the body as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And guess what? Stress is correlated with inflammation, which is correlated with most disease. Yeah. Cortisol, right? Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's just like this very complex puzzle. And so to me, what health at every size does is it just starts to, you know, it encourages a more compassionate kind of self-care, right? Mm -hmm. It encourages a joy in movement, you know, finding joy in it, not doing it because we want to get X, Y, or Z out of it, but just understanding that it's just an inherently joyful thing, you know, and supporting humans of all sizes in doing joyful movement to whatever degree they're interested in doing it. It encourages eating in a flexible way that feels pleasurable and feels attuned to who you are as a human and how you live your life and what your values are. It's just so much value on the lived human experience and understanding that me, a white woman living in Canada at my size is living a very different experience than a black woman in the South of the United States or a gay woman in Texas or whatever. Understanding that there are so many layers to the identities that we have and that affects our lived experience, which in turn affects our health, right? Mm -hmm. So basically is the shift that we could consider is the stopping pursuing weight loss, but instead pursuing health? Yeah. Yes. And, but we have to separate them, okay. right? So this is, this is really key. Understanding that it's a very different thought process. Pursuing weight versus pursuing health is a very different thought process. And this is something I know you mentioned potentially having Isabel Fox and Duke on the podcast mm -hmm. at some point. And she is someone that I learned from amongst many other people who are in this world who I, I also highly value. But this is something that I feel like Isabel really made concrete for me, right? Is the fact that it's two very different psychological processes. And so there is a reason, and this is what I saw all through the 11 years of my like general naturopathic practice is we're human beings finding it difficult to do things that were good for their health and calling it self-sabotage, quote unquote self. Why do I self-sabotage? And then stepping back and seeing how when you are in a diet culture, when you are in a thin as best culture and weight is on the table, that it affects our ability to pursue health in an authentic way because we're constantly trying to obey rules. We're constantly trying to get it right. We're trying to do it right instead of doing what feels best to us. Because when we're pursuing weight loss, mm -hmm. in my view, the number one thing is because we quote unquote, don't like or hate our current body physical aspects. So first of all, there's a lot of negative emotion against our own body. Yeah. And because we're on a diet, we're following a plan that is outside of us that tells us how to eat and how to do things instead of being guided by our own body and our own spirit, mind, whatever you want to call it. Correct? Yeah. And we end up in a place of, you know, the key here is understanding that that mentality, like trying to stick with a plan that is probably not very natural or authentic for us, is the thing that actually triggers the reactionary eating, sometimes called binge eating, right? Mm -hmm. And so understanding that the attempt to lose weight, like dieting is basically any behavior whose main priority is weight loss, right? And diet mentality is the thought process that surrounds that, right? So any activity or behavior where the main priority is weight loss and the appeal of which would be gone if you weren't promised weight loss at the end of it, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's dieting and diet mentality. And that is what being in that mode is what triggers the negative behaviors, the reactivity, the resistance, right? So you can't do one and then be calm and peaceful. Do you know what I mean? Like mm. you can't be in diet mentality and be calm and peaceful and attuned and flexible and intuitive. You're in sort of like all or nothing mode 
or you're in flexible attuned mode. You can't be in both at the same time. It's impossible for the human being to be in both. You got to quote unquote, chose your camp between the two. And, and that's why the invitation or what I said that triggered this part of conversation. So what about if we were to pursue health instead of weight loss, which is the basis of the health at every size movement? Yeah. And that's what I propose to women. Like what if we decided just to pursue health, but this is tricky, right? Because untangling these things It's just challenging. It's very, very tricky. And so, you know, we have to be really realistic about it and understanding that for a long time, this desire to lose weight is going to continue to stick around, you know, like it's not just going to disappear. And so it's how do we start to, number one, identify diet mentality right away when it's present and then evaluate whether we're doing something because we just genuinely, authentically want to feel better in our physical bodies. And when we're really doing it, because we hope our bodies will change, like our weight will change, right? So that's the deep question that has to be asked over and over and over again, as we make decisions around food and movement. It's like, why am I doing this? What's my real motivation here? And because almost anything can be in diet mentality or not, it's all about the motivation that we bring to the table. So I can give an example of a woman I was working with recently She's been through my one-on-one food freedom body love program and she's at the end of it and she's feeling great and she's out of diet mentality for the most part, understanding of course that this is a process, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) And we live in a diet culture. So you have to continue to work yourself out of that mentality day in and day out. But you know, she had one of these cleanse juices in her fridge that she had bought before we worked together. And she sort of said, okay, so I've got this whatever cleanse juice in my fridge and I would like to use it because my body feels good when I use it and I paid a lot of money for it <laughs> and I don't want to just waste it. And I'm just worried. I'm worried about making this choice. Like, I don't know how to make this choice. Like, am I doing it for health or am I doing it for weight? And I said, okay, well, how do you use it? You know what I mean? And it's like, well, I have to drink the juice all day and I can't eat any food and whatever. I said, well, how does that make you feel? Just when you say that out loud to me, does that feel like a flowy downstream peaceful decision? Or does that seem like anxiety producing, challenging thing to do? And she said, it feels anxiety producing. I said, okay, well, that's symbol number one, you know, sign number one, (laughs) that this is not going to be great for your health as if it's anxiety producing. So it sounds like doing it like that is diet mentality for you, that it's around weight loss and it's around control and it's around making your food look a certain way and eating perfectly. And that doesn't sound good for you. But I looked up the ingredients, you know, we were on the phone together and they were actually quite good. And I said, well, if you weren't in diet mentality, if you were going to use this product in a non-diet mentality way, is there a way we could do that where you would be getting the benefits and using the product as a supplement that wouldn't be triggering you? in a negative way. And so what we came up with is she can actually take a shot of this cleanse juice every morning and evening for a week or two until it's gone. And she'll get the benefits from all the supplements that are in it and the herbs and the cleansing things, the properties that are in that juice. And it doesn't feel like a diet. It feels like something that's adding to her life instead of a restrictive thing, right? And so what we've basically done is step out of diet mentality, right? And stepping out of diet mentality means there's no rules around how we do things or how we use things. There's no like exercise is only worth it if you do a half an hour or the cleanse is only worth it if you do it this way. It's understanding that anytime we make a decision that's good for our health, anytime we take a step in that direction or we choose to take a step in that direction, we're benefiting right? It's not all or nothing. There's so many shades of gray. That is brilliantly said. And for the listener right now, if you haven't yet taken part in the Going to Beyond the Food project, we dive more into this with Dr. Jillian in her talk. So yeah, yeah. go and look at it's free until November, depending when you're listening to this, this whole project, the summit, the online conference is free until November 8th. So go back and register for that and listen to the talk because this whole diet mentality is the next piece and how do we get ourselves out of the rules because that juice glance example is perfect like here's the product here's the rules you don't have to obey by it then what are you going to do 
No, no. And the same thing happens. Like I caught myself. I still catch myself in this, right? Like one of my favorite things to do is just walk and listen to podcasts. And, you know, I had this moment where I realized that like, I didn't have time to walk or listen to podcasts. And I was starting to feel kind of bad in my Mm -hmm. body. And (laughs) because it's something that really connects me and it really does make me feel physically amazing. And then I realized that I had this weird internal rule that if I couldn't walk for at least 45 minutes, it wasn't worth it. And so I was like, wait a minute, I definitely have time to pop out for 15 or 20 minutes in the morning. Mm -hmm. And I benefit from that. It changes my frame of mind. It changes the way that I feel in my body. It, you know, fresh air and it's like a moving meditation for me. And so I had just set up this weird subconscious belief about (laughs) what made walking worth it. And, you know, you will continue to catch yourself with these diet mentality-ish thoughts and beliefs. And you just have to keep pulling them up and asking the question, is this really about health? Or am I just believing I'm not like burning enough calories or something? You know, I mean, I don't know what was there in that for me. I just know that I just had this belief about what was healthy and what would make a worthwhile walk, you know? (laughs) Totally. So there's actual science behind that. So for the listener, you can go back to a podcast with Dr. Susan Pierce Thompson. She's a PhD in food psychology. And she explained that in our brain, we literally have like groove into which we have beliefs and habit that's been embedded through media through people teaching us things for the last 20 and 30 years and that we react to that without questioning which is pretty much the whole diet mentality we've been taught that for years and now we react to our relationship to food under those diet mentality groove that we have in our brain Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we need to re-educate that there's other possibility instead of pursuing weight we pursue it health and then we all we need is understand our intention behind our choice. Yeah, absolutely. That's the key, right? If you want to, and there are a few other things, but that's the real key to learning how to pursue health without diet mentality is being honest about your motivation. And it's fair for occasionally weight to be a small percentage of the decision. You know, I just try to be sure that it's relegated to something really small. You know what I mean? Like a small percentage of the decision that most of the decision is for my physical health. Right. And then there might be this like sneaking thought in the back of your mind, like, Oh, drinking bulletproof coffee might make your body change. Cause I read it somewhere, you know, it's kind of impossible to erase some of the things that we've read. But for me, you know, when I drink bulletproof coffee in the morning, like I feel better, like the caffeine affects me less and my blood sugar feels more stable through the day and I feel more energetic and I can see that that thought is there. It exists, but it's a small percentage of the decision, right? And if it were bigger, then I would pause and I would think about maybe this is not actually a good thing for me, or maybe I need to think about doing this differently. Yeah. So you go into more detail into that, into your talk in the Going to Beyond the Food projects, I would get the listener to go there, but we're going to wrap it up because we could chat for hours, but I know we could just go and go and go. (laughs) I got to keep it concise for people listening. So I'm going to wrap it up to come back to the beginning because we descended different aisle here. But the whole question was, is our weight, is the obesity or the fact that we carry weight around us dictative of what our risk for health condition is. And now I think you're in a better position for the listener to make your own decision because you've had information provided to you that hasn't been provided probably anywhere else. Yeah. And I would say that there are still so many questions around fat and health. And it's like, we don't really know all of the answers, but what we do know is that health behaviors definitely affect health, right? Mm -hmm. So Why not focus on what we know for sure can affect your health if that's what your motivation is, right? If that's what you want to achieve is health, which to me is just resources to live the life you want to live. What we do know will affect your health, our health behaviors, right? Mm -hmm. So focus on that. Absolutely. Thank you very much for having spent 48 minutes with us today. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. We will link in the show notes, Dr. Jillian's website and the Health at Every Size book for you to refer to. Thank you for being here with us. And I think we're going to do a lot more of this together. Amazing. Thank you, Stephanie. There you have it. Did it blow your mind? Now, if it did, and it impacted you in any way, I need your help. I need you to share this information. As you can probably understand, this is a grassroots 
movement. This is going against the grain. This is information that certain corporation and industry do not want us to know because it will prevent them from making profit, from cultivating a dogma. So I need you to take action now. I need you to share this episode with other women or other people in your life that needs to know this information. You can share the podcast episode. You can share the Going the Beyond the Food project and encourage through your own testimony, through your own viewpoint, other people in your life to listen to this information. So you can access the link to the Going to Beyond the Food project inside of the show note of this podcast. All of that can be done easily. You can access it through the website at stephaniedoze.com slash 097. You can share the show note, share the link to register. There's many ways for you to do this, whatever feels comfortable for you. But know that without your help, this information will not go out to the wide public and it needs to go out. That is my mission in life. That is why I changed my career. I want to help people, but I need your help. Now we have a great show coming up, episode 98, which will be released on Thursday. But here's the thing. I do not know yet what the topic will be because I want to keep it open so we can see what the discussion is over the weekend in regards to the opening of the Going the Beyond the Food project. I want to discuss with you via social media, via my online community, and create an episode on Thursday that will answer some of your question or will drill down even more on some of the concern or opinion that you may have following the opening of the Going to Beyond the Food project. So, title to come, topic to come, but let it be know that it will serve many of you. I'm glad that you were here till the end, and I encourage you strongly to go follow Dr. Jillian's Murphy work and you take the next step if that is a right fit for you. Thank you. I love you and I'll see you on the next show.